All right. Hello and good morning. It's Nikki Ramirez here. We are coming to you live on Friday, June 12th at 9.30 a.m. Pacific, uh, broadcasting in part from my home office in Santan Valley, Arizona, um, and along with a special guest who is just a bit a ways across the country to the east who will um, announce herself shortly. But um, I just, first of all, as we kick off, wanted to say thank you so much for coming together. Thank you so much for being interested in learning about and hearing about what you and I and others can do to best step into our leadership and focus on leading conversations in our communities and our workplaces that focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, we know that we're in an incredibly interesting and difficult time, and we know that we are challenged right now to show up in our leadership in a way that perhaps we have not been challenged to do before. There have been uh, many times throughout my career in the last 20 or so years where I have been told to keep race and diversity and equity and justice out of the workplace, um, but we are not there any longer, and I can't wait to talk about that. So as we get going, the first thing I would love to do is announce our other panelists and um, get this really kicked off. So let me show you some pictures of who you have on the line to facilitate today. Um, so I would love for um, Deanna, if you're up and your mic is on, I would love for you to introduce yourself. Tell us about yourself, uh, the work that you do, and anything else you think is appropriate this morning. Awesome. Thank you. Can you hear me well, Nikki? Yes, I can. Absolutely. Okay, good. That means the mic is working well. So, hello, everyone. Good morning to those of you that are tuning in where it is still morning and good afternoon if you're on the East Coast and it has just hit the afternoon. My name is Deanna Stinson Reese. I am CEO of E3 Professional Services. Um, and basically, what my company does is we work with minorities to advance them in their careers, but then we also partner with different organizations and companies that are trying to diversify their leadership. Um, as many of you may already know, a lot of the C-suite and um, high-level senior roles in companies are occupied by whites and, and white males specifically. And so there are companies that are committed to really being um, intentional about having an equitable, um, corporate workforce um, from the lens of their leadership. And so we partner with them to make sure that they are being equitable and, and finding viable candidates to fill those high level leadership roles, as well as making sure there are systems and, and programs in place that will help to make these employees that are from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds feel supported um, be supported, not just fill it, but really and truly and genuinely be supported within the workplace. Um, and that's pretty much, you know, what it is in a nutshell to be 100% transparent. Um, and so we tackle it from two different lenses. And I'm excited that Nikki has tapped into me to come in and share my insights with you all, uh, because I do have a background from my traditional corporate experience, um, working with institutions on how to be equitable with their hiring practices, cross-cultural communication, um, and creating those um, safe spaces for underrepresented groups to feel supported within the workplace. And so now that I've branched out and have begun doing it on my own, I definitely can see the larger impact that it is making. Um, and I'm excited to continue to partner with organizations as I continue to grow and to be here and help you all in whatever capacity I can. Awesome. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you. And I'm so glad that you accepted the invitation. You know, you and I have been friends um, via LinkedIn for a couple of years. And yeah. I, have, yeah, I have absolutely relied on you for perspective and sort of hang out in the background and learn and listen all of the time. So um, to our friends who are here on the call that are new friends today that don't know you haven't connected, you know, I feel like, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like LinkedIn is where uh, people can get the most um, insight from you from a professional perspective. Oh, yes, most definitely. Um, yeah. To be 100% honest, the mm -hmm. Instagram and Facebook generally tends to cater more so to our B2C clients, which are the individual professionals, sure. but a lot of the uh, corporations that I work with, 
those relationships do begin through the LinkedIn content that I provide, the articles and things like that, and just the engagement overall. So LinkedIn is definitely the best place to find this, this type of information that people are wanting. All right, really good. All right, so I'm going to um, move us along to introduce our next um, participant and panelist here today. And the person, if you're looking at your screen, the person that you are seeing in the middle is Luis Ramirez. And he is coming to us from the other room in our house. And Luis, you, your mic is open now. So if you wanna just say a hello and let everybody know a little bit about your background. Sure, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I sure can. Perfect, well, my name is Luis Ramirez. I am an attorney. I am also married to one Nicole Ramirez. And I have been an attorney uh, since 2003. Um, my initial uh, area of practice was in labor and employment. Uh, you know, I worked for a defense firm getting uh, employers out of trouble when they found themselves in trouble. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that, um, you know, involved claims by, you know, by usually diverse populations, underrepresented groups. It's just the way kind of the laws are, are, are done. And, uh, and then the second part of my career, I do, I do consumer law, but I still uh, practice now and then in helping employers, advising them in, in any disputes they might have with, with employees and, and hopefully um, you know, on the front end trying to prevent any, any disputes from, 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 from devolving into full-blown litigation. And so, so my, my experience in this issue comes from just my work experience and also from my personal experience as a as a you know, as a minority attorney, I am from the Dominican Republic. Um, you know, I work for a big uh, law firm, a national law firm, and there weren't many of us there, so I have experience on both ends. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's always nice when I can compel my um, friends and my husband to participate in important conversations like this. Um, and I know that the depth of experience that you bring to the table today. Um, it's really quite unique, you know, from your experience, like you said, as a minority attorney, um, living that corporate experience, working in the defense and the employment side of law, and then, of course, as um, an immigrant to this country, a successful entrepreneur, and someone who has um, thrived in your career based on your commitment to education and learning, as well as your commitment to teaching and sharing. You know, I think you're such a great person to have here, regardless if you're my husband um, and I love you dearly. <laughs> so thanks for being here. All right. Um, and then just, you know, before we really hop into the conversation, again, I'm Nikki Ramirez. I'm the founder and principal consultant at hranswers.org. That's the website where you can find us. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. And just in short, our firm, uh, focuses on providing practical, impactful, and progressive HR support to business leaders, whether you're working in education, government, private business, nonprofit. Uh, we want to help you get a plan together to put your best foot forward in supporting your employees, focusing on compassion, communication, kindness, and compliance. So that's it in a nutshell. Let's go ahead and um, kick off here by doing just a little bit of conversation about, um, or let's look at our plan. Sorry, what's our roadmap here? So opening conversation that we're going to have, um, we are in the midst of an evolution. Um, that's the word that I've chosen to use today, and I'm open to any word choice that you all have, but we are in the midst of an evolution. We are on um, what I am calling, because I don't know what to call it, what I am calling the long march for justice that perhaps began uh, when the 13th Amendment was passed many, many, many years ago in 1865. And this March for Justice has continued. It's exhausting for people of color. It's exhausting for Black and Indigenous people, um, immigrants, and many of us um, who are not uh, in that minority population have found ourselves in a position to really um, learn and tackle, especially from a leadership perspective, some of the unique um, opportunities that are being presented to us right now. And so that's why you're here, I hope. I hope that you're here because you are a business leader who is absolutely committed to facilitating new, open, difficult conversations. And I hope that you are a leader that is open to um, learning through experience and not being afraid of making a few mistakes. You know, Luis will share today his perspective from his uh, legal experience, you know, what happens when we fail to build trusting relationships. 
with people. You know, we can see that blossom and evolve into litigation sometimes, right? But, you know, even as we make mistakes, we endeavor into new territory as leaders, if we focus on trust and communication, uh, we can control and mitigate a lot of that risk along the way. So thank you for joining me um, and our panelists on this long march for justice. And these conversations that you will be having in the workplace are a part of this progress and a part of this evolution. Today, we're going to talk about a few key topics as we go through um, our time together today, which it might be 45 minutes, it could be an hour, we're pretty flexible, um, and we'll be, I'll be capturing questions throughout the session. Um, you guys have a question panel, by the way, we're in GoTo webinar today. You have a question panel on the right side of your screen, it's a little question mark in a bubble. You can submit questions and comments to me at any time during the session, and I'll be moderating those to uh, Luis and Deanna to answer. Uh, we want to talk about facilitating uncomfortable conversations. We want to talk about ways that we can develop trust. We want to talk about how we can identify and adopt characteristics of inclusive leaders in the workplace. And we need to talk about how to be vulnerable as a leader. We need to talk about, you know, what do I do when in my heart and in, you know, in my experience, I don't feel like I know what to do. I feel like I'm leading without a map. What do I do? So that's our that's sort of our rough conversation. This is unscripted conversation, so it's going to come from the heart. It's going to come from the soul, um, and we're looking for both your input and feedback too. If you'd like to give um, some feedback, or if you have a question that you'd like to speak during the session, just hit me in the question panel, and I can unmute your mic. I'd be happy to do that. This is not a, a private space for Deanna, Luis, and I to just share our ideas, but also a collaborative space for you to ask questions and share your experience as well. <clears throat> All right, so as we kick off, um, and Deanna, I'm going to unmute your mic, and Luis, I'm going to unmute your mic as well, um, and then hopefully we won't get any feedback, but if we do, I might have to manage the manage the muting again, um, but I want you to be able to provide some input, too, as I, as I walk through very quickly a few important key terms, and, you know, having a background in language study myself, um, and Luis does as well. Actually, Luis and I met in college at ASU at Arizona State. We were both studying Spanish. And so terms and language are very important to us both. And I think that for the purpose of this time together today, which is short time, not a lot of time, uh, I want to make sure we're operating off the same glossary. All right. So first, um, the terms that I wanted to share. Oops, sorry, guys, I'm clicking and nothing's happening. We're going to um, identify what it means to talk about diversity in the workplace, workplace, equality, equity and inclusion so deanna of course this is your space for work and expertise and so as yeah. i present an opening idea i am looking for your expansion and your improvement on this okay so okay. yeah so for everybody here um, when we talk about diversity in the workplace diversity initiatives are the idea that we would incorporate programs and activities where we allow and invite people from different backgrounds different perspectives to join our work groups to join our teams to join our projects that's the basic idea very like i said very boiled down idea of diversity in the workplace Deanna, what else do you think about the term diversity um i think with diversity is um it's also very fluid um because it's understanding and recognizing that um it is not always um, at face value sometimes. Um, diversity can be things that are not obvious to the common eye um, and you have to be conscious of different biases um, that and those are those like implicit uh, the implicit bias that comes into play when you are trying to approach diversity. That's one of the things that makes it turn into something that is not helpful when people are, you know, very much are trying to be helpful when they have these unconscious biases um, and implicit biases rather that allow them or don't allow them, so to speak, to really be genuine in their diversity efforts, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I think as leaders, you know, we, um, we know that engaging in diversity initiatives or activities is the right thing to do. But until we can identify, own, and get through the uncomfortable realization that we do have bias, that we do have unconscious yes. bias, then we are in no position to impact that diversity program. And so, 
yeah, there's important work to be done so that that's even a possibility, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, next term, and Luis, you're going to have to just fight for fight for floor time here if you want it. But <laughs> uh, important terms, um, part two here. Uh, this is an image that was created by Craig Froley, PhD, and I hope I didn't um, butcher that last name too bad. But the title of this image is called "Equal Treatment Doesn't Yield Equal Outcome." So, you know, for me, when I'm trying to help people understand, you know, why we're focusing on equality or equity or whatever the case might be, um, where we have to take a moment to pause and think about, okay, if I am a leader who is committed to building an organization that is fundamentally operating successfully on the basis of diversity and inclusion and, you know, all of the bits and pieces that put those programs together, then I am likely in a position to talk about how we operate under the principle of equity in our company, mm -hmm. in our business, right? So, you know, Deanna, I know, you know, you've probably seen this picture or something like it in the past, but what do you, what does it say to you? How does it, what does it speak to you? It is, so the image that represents equality um, is generally um, what I've observed the way many organizations approach uh, DEI work, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. They approach it from that lens of the equality image, when in all actuality, it's really equity, right? There is a disconnect with how to be equitable across how, or not across, excuse me, how to be equitable within the work that you're doing when it comes to diversity, inclusion, um, within your organization, because the fact of the matter is, and this this is part of the conversations that have to be had in the workplace, a minority does not have the same access and, and, and opportunities that a white person has. A black person does not, or a minority does not have the same trajectory that a non-minority person has. And so, you can say, oh, okay, everyone is able to apply for this VP of marketing role, and we're gonna look at all the candidates. Everybody has the opportunity to apply. Okay, yeah, you're presenting the opportunity equally to everyone, but equitably, if that minority has not had access to the same resources and opportunities, the playing field looks different, especially when you think about what professional development looks like within an organization. A lot mm -hmm. of times it's approached from the lens of what someone with a certain level of privilege has already had access to. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that um, I've been tackling uh, very intentionally because people will say, well, it's hard to find qualified candidates that are of the uh, non-white non -right, uh, background to fill these leadership roles. And then I will challenge them to say, well, what have you done within your organization to groom and to meet the unique needs of your minority staff members so that you have a strong succession plan that incorporates diversity and it incorporates inclusion so that you have equitable hiring practices. Yep. And so that is when like the light bulb kind of goes off because a lot of people don't understand and realize we, we aren't afforded the same opportunities and access to information, resources, and, and that's a lot of times one of the barriers that keeps minorities from being as far in their careers as their non-minority counterparts. And then when you add on the systemic issues that are in place, it makes it almost, it's pretty much impossible for them to really get ahead like they should be, where it is an equitable playing field. Um, and so I love this image. I'm so glad you chose it because it is an accurate rep representation of what we are fighting for right now, equity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and equity I think, is. yeah, and you know, and I personally like this image because my mom is in a wheelchair. She's paraplegic and she mm. has been since the car accident when she was 15. And so that ramp to me is the, the you know, it's sort of the image and the example that, um, the resources that we have to disperse across our organization to help people be successful, everybody doesn't need the same amount of resources. Everybody mm -hmm. doesn't deserve the same amount of resources, nor do they need the same exact thing. You know, some people, mm -hmm. you know, we've got someone here who's tall enough to see over the fence. We've got someone who needs two boxes and we need a ramp. 
And so, you yeah, know, exactly. meeting people where they are as leaders is what we are compelled to do. You know, and I think, um, you know, just if I can share my overall philosophy in business and life, you know, our job as leaders now and always is to leave people better than we found them. It's to equip them for success moving forward, whether it's in your organization or out of your organization. If you stay together or you separate, we have to leave people better than we found them. We have to give them what they need to succeed. Awesome. Agreed. All right. Agreed. All right. So um, let's see. Um, I had a note come in in our question panel that says, may I share this image with a credit line on LinkedIn? Um, absolutely. When you download the slides, oh, actually, it's not in there. I'll drop it into the chat. So if you guys want the, the name of the person who um, created this image, I'll drop it into the chat so you can download it. All right. Um, one more quick term here before I do our questions and answers. Um, the term here is inclusion. So we talked about diversity. We talked about equality and equity. And then as we continue, I want to just mention that this idea of inclusion as a practice within your organization, as an activity in an organization, is the idea that we would create and deploy practices and programs that specifically have the effect of giving power and giving voice to those who are traditionally or historically oppressed. And so we have to look at that, you know, that pool of resources that we have, the boxes, the ramps, all of it. And we mm -hmm. have to create programs and practices to deploy those resources so that those who are historically traditionally oppressed have an opportunity to come to the table to be on that playing field and to do their best work. So that's what, you know, to me, that's what inclusion is. And one thing that I've noticed, Deanna, as we've really cracked this, you know, conversation open over the last couple of weeks is there's so much to learn, including things like um, abbreviation. And so somebody mm -hmm. uh, sent me a message on LinkedIn and said, I don't know who else to ask, but what does DIPOC mean? And in my head, I'm like, well, you can ask Google, but that's okay. I hear, I'm here. I love you. So let's talk about it. You know, so. <laughs> So black indigenous people of color, that's what it means, right? But I just thought it was such a good example that, you know, as a part of this whole entire, I, I guess, you know, process that we're in as leaders to evolve our leadership, that we have to learn new language. We have to get on the same page. We have to learn new yeah. ways of operating and communicating. Yeah. Any I other thoughts on inclusion? Nikki, no, you hit this one on the head. I mean, you hit the other ones on the head too, but. <laughs> This is exactly like to its core inclusion, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's not just having the program. It's not just having, oh, an initiative. What are you physically doing? Where is the action behind it? And that is uh, visible through practices and programs. And, you know, one thing that if you haven't already seen the various individuals that are on the line um, mm -hmm. that they will continue to see is people uh, are calling out organizations that are merely making statements and there's no word i mean there's no action behind those words right mm -hmm. like you say oh i support this community i believe that they deserve you know equity and they deserve to be treated fairly etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. but there's no action behind it what have you right. physically done to demonstrate the inclusiveness what have you physically done to mm -hmm. demonstrate you are not just putting somebody in a role as the token minority person to say, we have diversity to check a mm -hmm. box. What have you done to really be inclusive to make sure this person has the power, the resources, the support, and the voice to enact change, to mm -hmm. enact things that are going to really improve operationally and and then of course for face value what is projected out to you know your greater audience which is the community the world so to speak what are you doing to make sure that those things are aligned mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, it helps the bottom line at the end of the day you know the contributions that are made it does nothing but attract more top talent for organizations it does nothing but uh, retain those top talent, those diverse top talent individuals, and it helps to improve the bottom line because it, it keeps that buy-in within a community. And so it's so, so important to really be true to inclusion. A lot of people can check a box for diversity and that box, you know, is that's even being called out now. And, and so people are getting the rugs kind of pulled from underneath them as it pertains to that. But the inclusion piece, there's no way around that inclusion piece. And that's the piece that is really getting organizations to catch fire. Um, 
as of as of recently. Yep. Yeah. yeah, definitely. No showboating here, and it's done for hard work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. All right. All right. Uh, well, just, just to add one thing as well to kind of you know on the pragmatic side of it, I, I think you know as was already mentioned, it's just good bit business to do so. And also, mm -hmm. if you look at the you know the benefit risk, you, you know you're not going to get in trouble for being inclusive. You're not going to be get in trouble for trying to have a diverse workforce. Exactly. Um, but on the other side of it, if you don't, um, you know, you you will eventually find yourself, you know, in, with a complaint or or something or from an employer or maybe even in, inside of a courtroom. So so just as you're if you're thinking about it, just as a you know, it, you should do this because it's the right thing to do morally. But also, as as a business decision, it's just a good way to protect your business, um, and 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 your efforts are not going to you know put your your employer or your own business in trouble if you try to be inclusive, if you try to uh, be diverse, have a diverse workforce. Thank you for that, Louise. That's very true. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So as we kind of we're kind of we're, all right, we're moving out of teaching glossary mode. And Deanna, thank you so much for improving my um, definition of my descriptions of how diversity, um, equality, equity, and inclusion work in the workplace. And um, so now, you know, I just really want to kind of jump in and start to talk about, you know, as leaders, for you know, for the people who are on the call today, for the people who are going to be um, tuning in later to the recording. We want to give people the courage, especially people who have not um, in the past been maybe one to open the door into a complex, difficult conversation about race, equity, inclusion in the workplace. We want to give you the courage and some tools and some ideas about, you know, sort of how you can position yourself to be successful in these conversations. And so um, the first thing, Deanna and Luis, that I'm hoping that you can sort of touch on um, and Deanna, maybe if you want to kick us off here, and then Luis, you can um, chime in. What are some of the keys to developing trust in the workplace? Because we know that when we build trusting relationships with our team members, we can work through very difficult, very complex issues. We can work through trouble. We can work through trauma when we trust one another. So Deanna, mm -hmm. what are some of the keys that you see to developing trusting relationships in the workplace so that these difficult conversations are even possible? Um, Nikki, the first, first and foremost, and what has shown to be very challenging um, in these past few weeks for um, individuals, especially individuals that are white, is acknowledging that there's an issue. If you negate or attempt to um, negate the fact that there's an issue by um, having these types of conversations where it's like, yeah, but, well, X, Y, and Z, but you lose trust off the bat. Like the trust is, the trust is gone and, and it's very hard to get it back because when you throw in that, that, um, I think it's, it's the conjugation. Is that the right word? Linguistics is not my strong suit. So you tell me if that was not the right word. But um, when you kind of add in that conjugation to say, well, X, Y, and Z, but blah, 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 you are deflecting the blame to the person that is dealing with the oppression or dealing with the inequality or dealing with the inequitable practices. And then they're, they're not going to trust you. They're not going to want to express to you the root of the issues that are in place. Um, and so the first thing, first and foremost, is pure acknowledgement, okay? There's no no, no, no deflecting. You have to acknowledge and, and own the fact that yes, white privilege does exist. Yes, it is inequitable in corporate America the way leadership is set up, hiring, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, that is a thing. Yes, it is real, it exists. You are right. I acknowledge that. Right. That mm -hmm. is the very, very, very first step before anybody is going to want to engage in any type of conversation around why, you know, it's an issue or how the, they can move forward with the company or how the company can can improve practices. No one is going to want to engage in the conversations. And I don't know if I can say I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate, but 
I have had to have those conversations with senior leaders in, in organizations where it's like, well, yeah, but, and it's like, no, no, there is no buts. There is no buts. And as much as I would want to be like, you know what, conversation over, you know, I'm done. Like, I'm not going to, you know, be the dead horse almost in a sense. Me being in a position of leadership as an expert, I have to keep going with those conversations and, and make sure I'm intentional with those conversations at the forefront because that's the only way to kind of break down the, the mindset almost that is in place because you're conditioned to it. It's, it's partly not even a lot of times their fault, so to speak, because they're conditioned to it. And so it does take work, but it's so draining for mm -hmm. a person who has been oppressed and who has dealt with the inequality and sees it for face value. It's as clear as day, but someone else who is benefiting from the privilege and benefiting from these systems, they don't see it. So it's so draining. And so if you cannot get to the point of acknowledgement, you've already lost the battle, hypothetical battle, when it comes to trying to attempt to have these types of conversations. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. So, yeah. so that, I would I would say that is the the very first step. Um, once you get past that, you know, you have to listen to understand, not listen to respond, right? right. Um, and so, listening to understand um, and being genuine in the clarifying questions that that you're asking um, to to get additional clarification if there is something that you don't understand, and then leaving the floor open or passing on the responsibility to people that are impacted to to come up with solutions right and so and when i say that i don't mean to say that um, a person who is not a minority cannot suggest or you know put forth solutions but it cannot be oh, okay well you said the problem is you know there's an equitable hiring okay this is what we're going to do to address that problem versus mm -hmm. seeking out the people that are actually impacted and affected by it you have to get their input and their input has to take precedence Mm -hmm. and, and so as long as it, it takes precedence and it, it makes sense from a from a standpoint of, you know, it's something that legally can be done, you know, it is something that is going to help to move the needle. And right. I don't know where the fear comes from, you know, why there's so much fear in, you know, supporting the the minority community, the black, indigenous, you know, and people of color as a whole. I, I don't know where this this heightened fear comes from because there's so much pushback mm -hmm. and i don't understand why there's so much pushback when just like louise just said it does nothing but help and in, in, in every facet when you are committed to diversity and inclusion no one's going to sue you because yeah. you were you, know, you were inclusive because you included you know everyone and it made their voices matter like you're not going to get in trouble for that so mm -hmm. why is this such a problem Right. Um, well, and I think those, if I can if I can just summarize for you too, just a little bit. I heard you say something really important, and so I want to make sure that everybody kind of um, you know everybody will process it in their own way. But what I hear you yes. saying is that as leaders, we need to learn how to uh, facilitate a process instead of have all the answers. Yes. Yeah, and yes. I think for a lot of leaders, you know, who come up in a traditional leadership development structure, especially let's call it corporate structure, um, leaders are taught to do, you know, do all the driving, and we we talk a big game about like giving people, you know, letting people have input, this and that. But when you go back to the boardroom, you just stamp it with your decision and roll it back out. I've seen corporate mm -hmm. boards not even look at employee surveys before rolling out a final decision about rebranding their organization or how to move forward with a DDE and I, um, you know, platform, you know, they don't, it's, so it's like leaders, we got to just look at the people who are impacted, look at the people who are being oppressed, look at those folks, and when they are coming to us to build trust, like you said, listen, learn from them, and then pass over the reins to help to build a system that is better, because clearly the system we built is not working. And acknowledge. Acknowledge is the yeah. first thing. That acknowledge is the piece that uh, is yeah. is a big issue. Yeah. Um, that stops everything else. There will be no facilitating if there's no right. acknowledgement. Yeah, we got to stop saying, "Well, at least this or but that," right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then to to add in a little bit, you know, even before you even get to all that, 
I think you need to try to create a, a work environment where people feel free to kind of raise those kind of issues. I think a, a lot of the times, you know, the philosophy that that business leaders and even people among their own friendships or even families, we don't talk about politics. We don't talk about, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you know, racial injustice, things like things that make us feel uncomfortable. We don't talk about them. Um, and, and, you know, and the workplace is one of those places and say, well, you know, people are here to work and they're not here to, to you know, to, to kind of engage in, in, in that kind of discussion. But the problem is, is that the workplace doesn't occur in a vacuum. Um, and so your workforce and, and, and the interactions that your employees are having at work, they are mirror interactions of what's happening in the larger kind of society. And so, for example, yeah. this time now you have, you know, you have Black Lives Matter, you have a lot of things that are, that are moving pretty fast and, 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 and pretty drastically in, in the last few weeks. And then people are going to talk about that. People, employees don't just leave that at the door and, and you know, and they become an employee and then they pick it up once they leave. So all that is there. And so if you try to create, you know, um, an environment at work and we, say, well, we don't engage any of that, we don't talk about any of that, not actively, you know, forbidden people to do that, which which be uh, its own problems, but, but just not being, you know, human enough to say, hey, what, you know, what's going on? And how, how do you feel about this? It doesn't have to be formal, just informal. Just let your employees know that, hey, we, we get it. There's things happening. We're not going to sit here and have debate, you know, society and, and about everything that, that's going on in the world. But this is a place where, you know, that, that if someone has an opinion, then, you know, we're willing to listen. And that creates trust because then, you know, the problems that people might be talking about might be just larger socials. It might just be a very short conversation. You don't, you know, necessarily have to agree on everything, but just the fact that someone's willing to to kind of listen uh, about what's going on, or at least not hide the topic. Um, then when there's an issue that pertains to the work itself, when an employee has an, uh, has an issue with another employee, when an employee has an issue with your company and they think they're being treated in an unfair way, they're more likely to go talk to you and trust you to try to resolve that issue because you've already shown them that that you know that you're not that, that you know hiding your head in the sand kind of leader uh, and so that'll help you resolve that issue before it escalates yeah, I think yeah, that's I can, back. nikki can i add to that are you is, yeah. is it okay to ask okay of course uh, it is. don't ask me of course yeah. it is. um i wanted to add to that because that was um a very, Louise brought up a very good point. And one of the things that, uh, for those of you that are leaders that are, you know, looking to try to set the tone, right? To basically begin these begin these conversations. And so when, what Louise said about, you know, making it okay to have these conversations in the workplace, part of that is going to start with you all acknowledging that, yes, there is a problem happening, right? And we want to talk about it. And like Louise said, it's not necessarily trying to create a space where it's going to be this back and forth debate about something that's, you know, out of your control to a certain degree. You can't, you know, affect what's going on outside of the workplace directly right now. But I understand that what's going on has a huge effect on a lot of you. And that does trickle into the things that are happening here in the workplace. And even some of the ways that we operate as a corporation. And so when you set the tone to begin that dialogue, it will not be immediate, oh, okay, let me go now tell my supervisor how, you know, he or she has been, you know, doing X, Y, and Z, which is, you know, indicative of a microaggression and I'm offended by, you know, X, Y, like that's not what's going to happen. Um, it's more so going to need to be the opportunity for almost like anonymous um, feedback to, to get those conversations going. And what you do with that feedback is really going to, in my opinion, from my experience, set the tone for whether or not your staff is willing to then trust you and engage in those conversations. But it's going to be a lot of the leaders leading in that capacity to start changing the dynamic of what is acceptable in terms of the conversations being had in the workplace. Because you can say, oh, yes, we want to have these conversations, but many minorities and the Black community specifically fear for reprisal. They don't want to speak up. I've had many people reach out to me that to tell me, you know, thank you for being this voice, because if I say something, 
I know I'm going to get fired. I don't care what they say. Yeah, they put out this diversity statement, but I know my supervisor is going to probably fire me or I know they're going to try to demote me or they're going to do X, Y, and Z. So I can't comment on your post to say that I support X, Y, and Z, but I want to send you this private message to tell you, you know, thank you for, you know, vocalizing these issues and for bringing awareness to X, Y, and Z. Um, and I've experienced it even from in a corporate setting where I am the employee, I'm working on diversity and inclusion initiatives, and they have me pretty much, you know, as the face to get the minorities to buy in, but they don't want to give me any feedback, not directly because I don't want to get in trouble. They won't, they don't want to give the feedback unless they know it is a safe space. And one of the ways to prove that, because it takes time to build trust, but one of the ways to start that, if they can submit feedback and that feedback is anonymous, and you take that feedback and you reintroduce it to acknowledge, man, this is an issue. I hate that this is happening. Can we talk more about this? How do we fix this? Tell us what to do. When you start to be proactive and show the action behind your um, uh, request or your initiative that you're trying to do or the change you're saying you're trying to make, when you put that action behind it, that is what's going to start to break down the distrust and build trust. Because right now there's distrust. That is really what it is. Right now there is distrust the majority of the companies and their minority employees. They are not, they don't, they don't trust, the minority employees do not trust to be vocal or to be open and transparent, regardless of if a company says, hey, let's have these conversations. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, let's have these conversations. And it's only so much I'm gonna say because you're not gonna fire me after you know getting me to express to you X, Y, and Z because you not you don't really like what I had to say, or you're really not in a space as a as a person and you haven't owned the fact that there is a problem. You haven't had the time to learn, to reflect, and to understand and acknowledge that there is a problem. So if I tell you this information or if I give you this feedback, I don't know if you're going to be receptive to it and understand that this is something that needs to be fixed and I don't want to risk losing my job. Right. I don't want to risk losing my job. Yeah, and I think that that speaks to the idea that you know, trust is built over time, right? Louisa and I just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary, oh, uh, May 27th. Thanks. And you know, um, I you know I'd be lying if I said that it was easy along the way. But you know, we uh, trust each other. But that was built on a lot of small baby steps along the way. And as much as we like to think personal relationships and work relationships are different, or somehow you know they they operate exactly the same. And trust is built over time. So like you said, Deanna, if somebody you know is fearful to come forward and make a comment, a suggestion, or make an observation known. Um, then they have to sit back and cross their fingers. Nothing, you know, bad is going to happen to them. That's an awful situation to be in. Mm -hmm. And but it is where we are. And so, you know, in building trusting relationships, you know, I would say that what I'm hearing is that leaders have to, you know, be inviting people into these conversations, be willing to listen without judgment, like you said, and then mm -hmm. literally create and invest you know, create time, invest in time to have these conversations. Let's not just publish an open door policy in our handbook. Let's have open office hours where you can come in and talk to me, the CEO, the director, the whoever. Like, let's take, like you said, Deanna, like, uh, you know, words are words, action speaks louder than words. Like, what are you doing to make sure that open door means open door, open door means open door with no retaliation? Mm hmm Yep. And, you know, Nikki, it, uh, people, this gentleman, um, I won't, you know, say his name, of course, um, he reached out to me um, and he wanted to do, he wanted to work with me, have me come in in his organization to work on um, some like diversity recruitment efforts. And initially, you know, I was like, you know, no, you know, I, I, I need some, have better understanding of, you know, what your, um, what how, what's your EEO looking like, you know, within your organization? I need to know more. Like, what is your, let me see your EEO report to, to get a better mm -hmm. understanding of what it is you guys are really, you know, doing and what your commitment truly is. And so the conversation just kind of stopped there. And I noticed he was on my different posts, like, you know, liking the posts, not commenting. And then he jumped back in my inbox and he told me, he said, you created this post about um, X, Y, and Z. And I have to admit, I was so ashamed 
because I was guilty of doing that and did not recognize how offensive that was to the black community. And I want to apologize to you towards the black community because I did not recognize that that was something that was offensive and why it was offensive. And he was like, I want to thank you for that post because it has now opened my eyes and I have a different, my heart is different now and I want to learn more and I want to be better. I'm now going to work with him because now I have, a, I, I trust that his, his mind and his heart is in the right place just from that brief interaction that mm -hmm. changed how I viewed his initial outreach because at first it looked like, hey, I'm trying to check this box, right? I see all of this tension going on. Can you help me with my diversity efforts? And you haven't talked to me or given me anything to show that you're committed to diversity. But then about a week or so later, you are you showed me and broke down how you were able to reflect in a way where I felt that it was authentic. I felt that it wasn't like you know, you're just trying to fabricate, 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 Jesus, something. Uh, you genuinely was able to reflect and, and explain what you used to do, how you learned that it was offensive and explain to me, regurgitate in your own words, why it was offensive from your own understanding and why it was wrong. So and maybe so, we can add that to our, our, maybe we can add that as number three then on our list of characteristics of inclusive leaders, right? So one was uh, show up and listen without judgment. Maybe number two is you know invest make make time for it and then take action. Um, you know, or take take no action. I guess you know no no retaliation, no reprisal. Sorry. Oh come and on. Then, <laughs> yeah, and then that's sorry. Woo! Yeah, and then number three, what I hear you saying is be willing to be reflective, be willing to learn and change. Correct. Yeah. Yes. That's yes. hard. We're here for it. <laughs> yep. All right. Luis, any thoughts as you're kind of hanging out in the background there? Um, you know, we're talking a lot about ways to build trust. We're talking about what happens when we don't have trusting relationships. You know, we're kind of transitioning into talking about what it looks like to be an inclusive leader um, and probably a vulnerable leader too. Yeah, I think, I think, and I think you guys touched uh, on on the issue of, of retaliation which is um you know on the legal end that's that's one of the ways to kind of get in trouble um mm -hmm. and so i think employees um employees are, are more likely to come to you and and tell you when they have problems when they feel like they're not going to be retaliated against uh, again so that's that, that's natural but then the, the other end of it as well is that um retaliation is kind of you know a double-edged sword because a lot of times as an employer you have to deliver bad news to an employee whether it be a you know a bad evaluation whether it be a some kind of discipline uh some kind of negative consequence of something that they did in their jobs and, and that's where the other part of you know trust and uh, comes from where you know if an employee to a certain extent trust you because you've had that relationship with them because you've had those discussions you know uh with them about inclusion when where you know where you've allowed them to express themselves then when you do have to do something to that employee that they're not going to particularly like they're going to be you know it's not it's not a it's not a shield it's not you know 100 percent of the time but they're they'll be less likely to kind of act you know take that negative action in, in a way that, that, you know, in a way that that's going to result in liability for you. They're going to maybe, you know, trust you that, that you're being fair with them because you've been fair with them in the past. So, and that the company's being fair with them because the company's been fair with them in the past. And so that's going to, that, that's going to help your company, your business. Yeah. And we know that employees talk too, right? Especially when, when I think about watching issues with, um, discrimination and retaliation unfold behind the scenes, you know, as an investigator in my work, uh, lots of times I hear that people, you know, they fail to come forward with their own complaint because they heard through the grapevine what happened when somebody else did it. And Louise, I know you have experience in your legal practice uncovering those kinds of facts as you investigate and litigate. So, you know, whether we, um, again, we can stand up all day and say we have a diversity program initiative, we're all about inclusion and equity, Oh, okay, sure, but when the rubber meets the road here and we are in high gear and things are tough, you know, what are your supervisors in the field doing? What are they saying? How are they treating people? And are they really open to listening without judgment 
investing time and building a trusting relationship, and are they willing to change and learn based on what they hear from their team? Or, you know, are you pushing employees, um, you know, minority employees, people of color, off into a corner, fearful that if they, you know, bring something up that they're going to be retaliated against? So we have to be careful to build our programs knowing that we've had a systematic failure in that space. Yeah, and that's and and that's a good point. Um, you know, you can do all that you can as a as a business leader uh, yourself to build that trust <clears throat> and to to kind of build that positive relationship and goodwill with with employees or as a company even company wide. But it, all it takes is one or two bad supervisors or um, or mm -hmm. one bad supervisor in, in in their daily interactions with that employee to kind of undo all the all the good work that that you may have done. Or, or the goodwill that you've built. And so the other part of that, uh, of that building trust as, a, as an employer and, and also you know, having a relationship with employees that, that's gonna be beneficial for both of you is to put a check on those, you know, on those supervisors or sometimes they might be other employees who are, who are, dis, you know, who are disruptive or, or, you know, or, or have these views that, that are offensive to your other employees, you know, racially and things like that. And 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 so if you don't, if if you if I'm an employee and I see that my, you know, that that, that I have a coworker or, or a supervisor that you know that you know that maybe not to the level of being actionable on discrimination, but you could tell that person is a bigot or that person and that person is just you know just has a rhetoric that's tough to deal with. The other the other part of inclusion. Um, of diversity and also protecting your company is to put a check on that on that other employee on that other supervisor. It doesn't mean you discipline them, but just you let them know that hey, this is what you know. These are the, the values that that our company uh, that our company um, thrives upon, and you know, and it's not just something that's written in our policy book. These are actual values that we practice, and you know. And you need to be careful and tread carefully in when you know and preserving those values and kind of follow along with that. And that will help, you know, also build trust then with the other employees where where they'll they'll see, hey, they're you know, they're they're putting their money where their mouth is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, when we engage in those practices to really kind of share our corporate culture, to hold people accountable when they step out of line with regard to respect and dignity, justice in the workplace. You know, that envelops everyone in the organization and uh, trust, you know, as I see it, and, you know, it, it definitely has a ripple effect, you know, when, like you said, when, um, you know, it can be, it can, and it can work either way, right? So you can either see what's happening, it can break down trust, or it can ripple out, and we can say, you know, my supervisor or my coworker made a mistake, but look at this, the director, the owner, uh, you know, they stepped in and they realigned. And as leaders, it's our duty to realign and to recognize when things are happening. And, you know, I know from sitting alongside Luis for a lot of years of practice um, and watching him help leaders control risk and liability, legal risk and liability in the organization, that when we say that, like, oh, we didn't know something was happening as a CEO or a business owner, that's not a defense. You know, you still have to trudge now through a lawsuit or through a charge. You know, we have to, as leaders, we have to sit up, we have to take notice, and like Deanna said, we have to be surveying our environment and collecting information and taking action on that information so that we can, you know, align with our values and we can really just practice open for people. So we're down to just about four minutes. We're down to about four minutes left in the hour, and I wanted to um, close with a little bit, you know, we have one more sort of question that I was hoping we could get to, and I think this is important for everybody on the call. Um, we realize that stepping into this space as leaders, especially if it's new to you, it is going to be uncomfortable. And Deanna, you already mentioned the idea that, you know, it is necessary to get uncomfortable to make moves right now that are going to impact systems and communities long term. So, um, you know, Luis has a lot of experience hosting uncomfortable conversations. You know, as an attorney, he often delivers bad news to his clients and others as well. So if it's okay, I'd like for him to start out and I'd like for you to close us up, Deanna. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. that sounds great. So Luis, talk to us about how in your, you know, life in legal practice and just your life in general, you know, what are some of the keys that you see to facilitating successful, uncomfortable conversations? Sure, I, and I think the, the the first thing to 
you know, the strategy that I use is to um, to acknowledge that the situation is uncomfortable, to acknowledge that the conversation that we're going to have is not a conversation that you might, you know, you might normally want to have. Um, that you know, and and so you know, you know, you may not, you know, it's it, you know, you can use whatever language works for you, but you know, a lot of times I tell folks, say, hey, you know, I, I I know that you may not want to hear this, um, but that we do need to talk about this, and and then you outline the reasons why you need to talk about it and acknowledge that it's difficult, and you know, and and provide them with verification of why you there why it's important to have that difficult conversation, you know, and one of the you know. And one of the main kind of issues uh, that that or that that I always let you know clients know is, you know, would you rather have this conversation now, where it's you know sort of uncomfortable, or we're talking about things that you may not want to talk about, or or I'm telling you things that 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 you may not want to hear, um, or would you rather I tell you nothing, or just kind of you know blow smoke and and let the problem get worse, and then you know and then sometime down the future now we're having the conversation again but now we're in in a, in a worse situation whether it's litigation or a complaint or 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 or, or something that has you know that a, a problem that's become bigger so so i think you know you know in one acknowledge that it's difficult use whatever language works for you and or sometimes you know you don't even need language this is going to be difficult to hear hey this is i know yeah i, I know we you know i i know you you don't want to talk about this but we need to talk about this and these are the reasons why and you know, and if we don't do it, then it's going to be worse. And this is, I mean, and then finish up with kind of confirmation of why and 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 of a plan of of hey, this is why we talked about it. Now that we've done it, I think this is what we've accomplished by it. And I think that that helps people kind of understand the why, you know, and 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 the and the, the process, and then and then also ultimately the end result. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I've often um, sat across the hall in our respective offices and heard Louis say, I, you know, I have to tell you this and it's not going to be something that you like to hear. <laughs> and, you know, I think we practice a lot of that, you know, kind of communication in our family and our kids probably want to choke us half the days. But, you know, I think it really is a great way to just enter into something uncomfortable is to acknowledge that this is going to potentially hurt and use whatever language is, you know, natural for you. So what do you think, Deanna? I know that you have experience with this from both sides of the fence as an employee yeah. and as a leader, as an entrepreneur who is successful in her work. You know, what do we need to be doing? What, you know, what's your top advice for us so that we can facilitate successful, productive, uncomfortable conversations? Um, yeah, so Louise hit the nail on the head. I'm not even gonna lie. Um, it, with the whole piece around <laughs> that is uncomfortable and one thing i guess i'll expand slightly you know and just kind of let everyone know when i'm coming in to facilitate these conversations even as a minority right when you think about it as a minority coming in in a room full of white males that you know i don't know what their viewpoints are the first thing that i am doing is making sure that it is understood that even though this information i'm about to give you is uncomfortable for you please understand it is also uncomfortable for me so you as a leader can also acknowledge your the fact that you may feel some anxiety you may you know be uncomfortable just like you know they are going to be uncomfortable so that way it's it, it's bringing to the forefront that i'm feeling things that you may be feeling also but making sure it's very clear that the focus and the forefront is still the person that is directly affected um, really so advice. yeah you don't want to take away from the fact of you know, the person that's being oppressed and this, this group of individuals, they're the ones that's really heavily impacted, but it helps when someone can tell you before they have this difficult conversation, hey, I'm not gonna lie, talking about this kind of stuff, it gives me anxiety, it makes me nervous because, you know, I never wanna be viewed as a racist or someone who doesn't understand that I have privilege, but I want to help and I wanna know more and I wanna be able to do better. So I really wanna have this conversation around x y and z that makes a world of a difference in preparing for that difficult conversation because like louise said you're putting it out there and letting it be known you know hey this is difficult like this is uncomfortable um and i think that it's okay to also say you know 
I get anxiety, like when it's time to talk about these kind of things, or I get afraid, or, you know, I get frustrated, or I can get sad because I know I'm not doing enough and I don't know what to do. It's okay to acknowledge where you're feeling as a leader, uh, especially if you are a white leader and you're like, I don't want to take away from the experiences of, you know, this minority community. You're not going to take away from it as long as you make sure you put at the forefront before that conversation starts. This is still ultimately, though, about you. So I want you to be the one to take the lead or I want you to understand that this is about making sure that change happens for the betterment of you and, and your community or, you know, the black community or the indigenous community, whatever your audience is or whomever your audience is. But it allows for the person that has to have the difficult conversation on both ends to recognize both parties are feeling uncomfortable in different ways. And, mm -hmm. and where that uncomfort uh, lies and, and what is the stem of it I, I, has been helpful for me, at least. I can only speak from, you know, the different instances and the conversations I've had to facilitate. And then the last thing I would say that something that I try and it happens to work is when it's face to face. Right now we're in COVID, so nothing's face to face. Uh, but when it was face to face, I would suggest, can we, you know, ask everyone to come comfortably, dress comfortably, right? You don't have to dress up in your heels, your, you know, business suit. Ask everyone to come and dress comfortably to help to dismantle some of the tension and some of the apprehension that is going to already be there because now you're at least dressed comfortably. So hopefully that helps to let the guard down a little because you're mm -hmm. not as locked up. Um, and so it's something so simple, but it has been pretty successful before COVID happened. <laughs> that's really, no, that's great advice. And I never, I've never heard that, Deanna. I think we've often heard like, and meet in a, you know, meet in a neutral location, right? Like that's, yeah. HR, that's in the HR 101 rule book, right? <laughs> if yeah. you're gonna have an uncomfortable conversation as a leader, make sure it happens in a neutral location. But I've yeah. never thought about saying like, hey, dress comfortably, come comfortable. That's so, mm -hmm. I love that. That is like, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, you guys. Well, we did have a couple of questions come in to the question panel, so I'm going to read those out in just a second. But, you know, for anyone that does need to jump off the, the live call, um, your time and your presence here today has been incredibly um, appreciated. You know, I honor each of you for showing up to hear a conversation about how we can step into our best leadership in this time where we are on a long march for justice. We are here as partners, collaborators, and allies to people who have been historically oppressed and people who have been discriminated against and who have been held down in our society and in our workplaces. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention and your time. Um, I did leave a quick three question survey um, at the end. So when you log off today, we would love your feedback, including any additional questions or any support that you need from here on out. Um, so please definitely be in touch. Um, and I'm gonna switch the slide over to our contact information. But again, then I'm going to start reading our Q&A. So if you have a question that you'd like to have answered, drop it into the question panel. And we are going to get started with Q&A. Deanna, are you still good on time? I'm good. Yep. Let's okay. Go. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So here we go. Says, All right. First question. How do we create equity without singling people out and making them feel discriminated against? Deanna, do you want to take that one? Sure. So... Um, it definitely, well, so it's a couple of things. Creating equity um, definitely in, does not and should not involve um, spe specifically, quote unquote, targeting, for the lack of a better word, one specific person or singling out a specific person. However, um, in order to be intentional and effective with equity, you will have to individually address groups. Um, and so you want to make sure you kind of follow those initial steps that we discussed before with acknowledging as a whole to the large masses. So if you have, let's say, 100 employees of those 100 employees, let's say 20 percent of them are minorities. You want to first address the entire mass, the full 100 employees in regards to this is an issue. This is why X, Y, and Z is, is an issue. This is where we stand on it. And this is what we want to do and how, what we want it to look like. So that everyone understands this is not just about, you know, Susie or this is not just about um, this one group and they're complaining. No, no, no. This is something that we as leadership understand is a problem. 
This is something that we are guilty of and we want to do better. And so we are going to be doing X, Y, and Z to start these conversations and to start to change the dynamic of our, our organization. And then from there, it'll then become decentralized where you are going to the specific group so that they do feel safe. You know, initially you're gonna follow those initial steps, but you're going to kind of work with them independently, I would say like as a group, to make sure they're comfortable having conversations because Louise brought up a very, very important point where it may not be necessarily top leadership. It may be a supervisor or it may be a bad seed just within the general employee uh, structure. And so you have to be conscious of that before bringing in groups that are oppressed uh, historically and currently that are oppressed that you are trying to advocate for and make change for because you likely do have bad seeds across all levels of employment nine times out of ten and so you're going to have them in a very uncomfortable situation if the trust has not been established um in in private between you and that community but also if that leadership has not addressed the masses like and and led the front and set the tone and the precedence what's not going to be acceptable what is acceptable this is why we're doing it if you don't like it you know that's on you you got to deal with it right. you have to kind of set that tone yeah yeah, I yeah and, to, and to add to that if, if i may it's mm -hmm. the, you know the other way to you know an additional way to do that as well is is, is, is to through training i think you can yeah. have your policies um that say you know you know about equity and and, and diversity and inclusion and, and things like that um but if if your employees aren't really aware of it because in reality you know you have a handbook people sign it they may get a copy they don't read it um but right. if you if you actively train them um then you're going to do two things you're going to one you're going to hopefully reach that one or two employees that are in uh, that in your workforce or supervisors that are that are kind of fighting against that equity that because they're jerks because they have their own biases whatever mm -hmm. the reason they are kind of working against what you're trying to accomplish and if you train you may reach those folks and even mm -hmm. if you don't reach them and change their minds then at least you deliver to them the message that that kind of behavior is not going to be accepted accepted by, by your company is not acceptable and so they may be less likely to engage in those kind of things that are going to get you in trouble with employees and then the second thing that that, that it does is is it sends the message and confirms to your workforce that hey they they're not just you know providing lip service they, you know they're taking affirmative steps to kind of get get these get these uh you know uh, you know e equity measures and, and and treatment out to the employees so the employees are aware of, of that, that that's the, the mode that the company wants to take. And so you can do that by, by training. So that's one way to do it. Uh, and, and I think, you know, and then, you know, not to be, you know, too much in about the litigation and, and, and things like that, but also it just looks mm -hmm. good. You know, if, if you say, if you have a problem and you say, hey, as an employer, if you come into a courtroom and, and, and you've never addressed any issues, you've never trained your employees on, on, uh, on on any of these issues uh then you know then then that that that's going to look bad you know as an employer however if you have and if you show hey i've taken these affirmative steps um then then you, you're also protecting yourself kind of kind of on that on that level um and then the other part of it is again you know just dealing again with with the idea of of, of equity and, and you guys did a really good job of, of, of talking about it um isn't so much also that that you're going to target someone or you're going to treat someone different as an employer you're still going to provide the same kind of um you know the same kind of treatment for the same kind of uh, behaviors and acts by employees so it's not that mm -hmm. you know you know joe over here is african-american and he did something bad and therefore we're going to go ahead and let him let him off the hook because you know right. that's that's not the point and i think that that's that's where you need to educate your employees that sometimes that you know there's there's already certain employees um that are starting kind of behind you know with certain supervisors and that that a certain supervisor is not going to you know let joe who's african-american uh get away with you know have have a certain uh, job outcome that's going to be different than 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 pete who's a white guy because they're buddies or because he knows them or so there's a, a there's an inherent bias that there and if we recognize that and train 
And again, training doesn't mean change, changing, uh, you know, the bigot's mind or changing someone's mind. It just means that sending out a message as a company saying, you know, we recognize that some, you know, some folks may have some inherent biases and, and we, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't subscribe to that. And, and so that's, that's another way to achieve equity is to just let, let your employees know that that's what you're about. So. Yeah, and I think you know another question, a follow-up question that came into our question panel talks um, specifically about small organizations. And so, um, if it's okay, I'll just share one thing that that I've seen work in the past, especially for small small groups where you have very few um, Black employees, Indigenous, or people of color on your team. Um, and again, you know, Luis just reminded us about the principle of of equity, right? Equality is everybody gets one, um, you know, one box, and equity means i'm going to give you whatever resources you need to be successful and so in small organizations um, where you have the capacity to sit down with your employees and talk through professional development plans and goals you will be able to parse out what resources someone needs and deliver those resources to them and then you don't have to give that same resource to somebody who already has that skill or that you know ability or that experience but where you find that your minority team member lacks experience, skill, or education, just because they haven't had the opportunity, nobody plunked it on their lap before. Now you are in a position as a leader to push forward and to grow, you know, grow them through the application of an equity initiative. You give them the resources they need. So sitting down with people, coming up with a professional development plan, and learning, for example, you know, Deanna, you mentioned this before, bringing people up through the organization. Learning who yeah. wants to come up in the organization. Not everybody wants to come up and be a leader. But if you, in a professional development, you know, annual session, quarterly follow-up, you discover that you have uh, a, an, an employee in your organization that has that interest in coming up through the organization, now you know you can deliver and deploy resources equitably because they're, they need, you know, they need that experience, they need that training. And, you know, I think that that, that one-on-one -on -one service to our employees is a great way to um, kind of avoid singling people out, but also then engage in very real and practical steps in deploying, um, deploying service and resources. So especially for small teams. Yeah, no, that's very good. That's very good. Awesome. All right, so we got, um, let's see here, um, another question. I'm just gonna read them um, kind of unfiltered guys. So <laughs> if, I have to, if I trip over myself or misread something, um, let, me, let me backtrack here. All right. Uh, how do we solicit feedback in creating change effectively and constructively? Deanna, what do you think? How do we solicit this feedback? I heard you use the word survey, um, I think, during our time together. What, what do we do? Do we survey people? Do we interview them? Do we host a focus group? What do we do? What's, the, what's your you top know, idea? My top idea, to be honest, I mean, a traditional good old survey is really probably where you want to start um, if you are already, you know, if the mistrust or the distrust is already there because it's going to be really challenging you can try to do a one-on-one -on -one interview but it's like are they really going to have full disclosure and be transparent when there's already things that are not um aligned in terms of the trust and here's how you can know if someone is thinking well how do i know you know if the trust is there um if you can't say for sure that the trust is there mm -hmm. the trust might not be there and, and that's the best way i can put it when people ask me that because you know you know you've invested in creating a certain type of workplace culture you know like oh i know i can bring in my employees and we can have this dialogue but if you're saying i don't know you want to err on the side of caution because nine times out of ten you probably have some distrust there okay mm -hmm. or the trust has not been built Got so it. I always just suggest, you know, to start uh, some type of like anonymous survey and, and you mm -hmm. making having a conversation with the entire team needs mm -hmm. to prelude that. So there yeah. needs to be an explanation, understanding the acknowledgement. I keep saying it because I can't stress enough how important that is to the process of building trust, acknowledging, hey, these are issues. I and I don't like that these are issues and I want to help. To, to bring about change. Power and privilege is an issue. Racial in, uh, inequality and inequity is, is an issue. So um, yeah, that's what I would say to that in terms of uh, soliciting that feedback. 
Definitely. Well, and I think too, um, good checkpoint for us as leaders, if we are not in a position where we feel comfortable or ready to deploy an anonymous survey to our organization, that may be a red flag that we have some internal work to do. And you know, because I've worked with a lot of clients who, you know, of course we talk about doing surveys, whether it's you know DEI related or otherwise, just an you know employee satisfaction type survey, and they can't stand the idea that it would go out and come back anonymously. That you know they feel like they might be targeted. Well, gosh, let's come to the table here and let's talk about yeah. what targeting really looks like. Are you really being targeted, or are people finally speaking up? Come on. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, it, so as a leader, if you're not ready to click send on that anonymous survey link, let's have a let's have a private talk about it. Let's have you call Deanna and talk about what you know what the what what's the hesitation? Why can't you click send? So yeah. survey's good good place to start. Thank you for that. All right, let me peek at our list here. Um, what about um, situations where we're told that we can't look at people uh, or acknowledge race? So like you know I don't see color type things, right? Like how do we and especially in recruitment, that's a question that comes up a lot. You know, we can't look at people based on their race, their religion, their able, ableness, their age, whatever it is. You know, we can't look at them based on color. But what about this idea that we just that we don't acknowledge it at all? Yeah, and that's that's a flaw. Um, the piece of acknowledging. So it's you can't judge, right? You can't make a judgment based on color, ableness, etc. But you cannot negate the fact that you see color and you see these other attributes. You can't negate that. To say a person doesn't see color is like saying you don't see me as a person because you can't help but see my blackness. You can't help but see it. So it's really, you're not supposed to judge based on it. You're not supposed to make you know these decisions about my capabilities, my character, et cetera, based on my attributes, like my color, um, my gender, my ableness, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't know yeah. if that question is from someone who's saying like their supervisor's telling them, you know, not to do mm -hmm. it. But um, it's, it's that's a red flag for me. Uh, I'm not even gonna lie. When I hear people say, oh, well, I don't see color. I give, I provide the opportunity to educate them on what you, I don't recommend you saying you don't see color because that's like saying you don't see me. Like, I, I am color. I think you hit it on the head, though, right? Like, especially in recruitment, um, it, we don't judge people based on their, you know, their appearance. We don't judge people based on their race, their religion, their et cetera. Um, we judge them on their character, their aptitude for a job, their qualifications. But I think the thing is, we have to remember that people haven't started at the same place. And so if yep. we say, I don't see color, then you don't realize that that black candidate sitting across from you, sure, they might lack a year or two of experience. Sure, they may not have had a supervisory role yet, but guess what? They didn't have a chance. And so, so now you are in a position as a recruiter, a hiring manager, a leader to say, you know what? I am in a position to give you the next chance. And so then you have a decision to make as a human to say, what am I willing to do? Because I do see color. I see that face across the table. I realize that you perhaps did not have the same opportunity and I am in a position to give it to you. And then the other the other thing is that you know you, you can say you don't see color and, and that may be that may be true for you know yourself individual and everybody has to supposedly you know struggle with that. I have my own doubts when someone says that as well. But now let's say you don't see color. Uh, but that doesn't mean that your supervisor feels the same way and doesn't see color. It doesn't mean that other persons, other other coworkers also don't see color. And so, although you, you may say that, that you don't see color, um, but the law recognizes and the law sees color. That's mm -hmm. why the law recognizes that one, that there's that, that there are certain groups that have been historically disadvantage and, and face discrimination and you know and therefore they, they have certain protections and they're you know they're called protected groups you know under title 7 88 you know people you know over 40 uh, uh, you know and so so there's certain groups that have been discriminated against because people do see color because people do see age because people do see gender and they do see liability so the law acknowledges that the law tells you as an employer tells tells all of us they you know you know, we don't live in a world that doesn't see color, that doesn't see age and gender and so forth and disability. 
And so therefore we're going to step in and, and we're going to have these laws that, that, you know, that regulate this behavior. So the law, the law acknowledges, the law acknowledges it. And so therefore you can't blind yourself to, to that fact, because if you do, then you're going to at some point run afoul of the law, perhaps not because of your own behavior, but, be, but, but behaviors of other, other people in your, in your company or other people in your employee. It doesn't have to be a supervisor, it could be a coworker that's you know that that's discriminatory that's racist that makes that make statements and if you as a company you know fall in in, in line with hey we, you know we, we're not going to pay attention to any of this um because we don't want you know we don't want any trouble then then eventually it's going to be a worse situation yeah well said absolutely all right. Well, that brings us kind of to the end of our question panel. So open Q&A unless anybody drops a quick question in at this time. Uh, we still have a good handful of people on with us today. Thanks again so much for joining us. Thanks for being willing to um, sort of have this uh, view into an open, honest, and you know, a little bit emotional and <laughs> fluid conversation about race, about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Um, I know I personally invite anyone who participated or who is listening in the future to any part of this recording to reach out to me and have a, a personal conversation. Um, I want to say thank you for coming. And Deanna, do you have any final final thoughts or anything to say? Uh, no, thank you. Just thank you to everyone, to you, Nikki, to um, your husband for, you know, just providing this opportunity in this space and being willing to listen and learn and share, you know, insights. Um, because this is where it starts, right? You know, having the conversations, asking the questions, being transparent um, and being open and honest about, you know, where we are and where we're trying to go. And so I appreciate those that, you know, decided to ask questions because it's not easy, you know, being the person that has to ask the questions. So, well, what about this? What about that? I recognize and understand that that's not easy because you don't want to offend anyone or you don't want to, you know, come across a certain type of way. And so it definitely helps. And I want to encourage everyone on here, you know, if you are a minority, a minority or not, if you have questions, you know, don't be afraid to ask uh, the questions because if it's coming from a place of genuineness, it will, it will be receptive to whomever you're asking that question to nine times out of 10. And so just encourage people to keep the conversations going. If anyone wants to have, you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation or talk more about, you know, what can be done with their organization, my contact info is on there. You can find me on LinkedIn and hit me up on LinkedIn, whatever is your preferred means to reach out. I am open to additional conversations. Oh, there's a, something I just want to also yeah, just wanted to yeah. thank thank Deanna for for her insight and uh, Nikki for for putting this thing on, and also for the folks that 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 attended and and that may be listening to it later on as well. Because the fact that you are listening and and that you take you know you took some time to to kind of um, hear someone talk on this topic already says a lot about about you and about your 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 business uh, leadership and and your and your intentions. So um, it could only help. And so, and so once you start from there, then, then I think everything else, you know, you're going to have some positive steps. It doesn't mean that every step you take is going to be the right step, but, but just the fact that you're trying is, is, is going to be uh, ultimately positive. And, and, you know, as I mentioned at, at the beginning, and then I'll close it out with this, it's just the right thing to do morally uh, to try, you know, to, 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 to bring, to, to face these issues and to try to help your employees through these issues. And, uh, and, and so, and so it, it's, it's just, it's, it's a good thing to do, but also it's the right thing to do for your business because ultimately it's, it's going to keep your business uh, kind of on the right side, you know, and even, even though you may not be the kind of business that discriminates and does the, the, you know, and, 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 and outwardly does these illegal things, but a lot of the, a lot of the problems that I've seen, um, you know, in, in my career haven't been, you know, some of them are true cases of discrimination. You know, black and white, um, to, for lack of a better term, of, of cases. But all, but you know, but a lot of them also just stem from employees just not being happy and not feeling like like the management cares or listens to them. And if the, and if you and, and if you take these steps, then they're going to feel that way. Whether where you know whether your steps are are, are you know are, you have some missteps along the way, but but they're it's only going to help you. So. Thank you.
Awesome. Well, again, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you for staying on 27 minutes past the scheduled end time. This has been um, a wonderful conversation to just be a part of. I did drop some of our key um, points when we were thinking about um, characteristics of inclusive leaders or actions that inclusive leaders take. So definitely feel free to check those out in the chat. And before I close out our session, I'll give you time also to download our handouts, which are copies of the slides, which will include the contact information you're seeing on your screen now. I also dropped in a couple of resources that I often share during training and, and with clients that talk about storytelling um, and talk about sharing your values. So as a leader, as you get into this hard work, into this uncomfortable work, uh, be prepared to share your experiences, be prepared to share how uncomfortable you are, um, and be prepared to carve out some time for this very important work. There's no time like the present to get started, and we are here to support you as you do. So thanks again for coming. Reach out if you have questions, and have the most fabulous rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nikki. Bye-bye. Bye, Deanna. Thank you.